We are um, almost done with substantial economic effect. Um, we did those review problems. Um, we're going to move on today to another um, difficult issue, but uh, I have a few loose ends that I need to tie up on substantial economic effect, and then uh, we'll move on. But before that, does anybody have any questions at this point on substantial economic effect? Now's a good time to ask any questions. They can be big questions, little questions, anything. Okay, well, hearing none, the, the loose ends that I wanted to tie up deal with uh, 1F, problem 1F, and then problem 1G. And in both of these cases, we um, established that the allocations in the agreement were going to be reallocated under PIP, um, that the allocations that would have gone to B end up being shifted over to A. Um, in addition, in G, we end up with a qualified income offset allocation. And um, what I didn't do uh, last class was explain the reallocation under PIP. And it's kind of confusing, but um, it's worth it to go through it. So let me pull up my whiteboard. So we're on problem 1F now. And in this problem, we've got, uh, so we're, we got A and B, and we did years one through five, well, they, did, they each contributed 100. And years one through five, all the allocation of depreciation went to B. That's year one through five of depreciation. And uh, we had the property here, which 200, and we had 100 of depreciation years one through five. So we just aggregated years one through five. And then we got to year six. The allocation in question, which is 20 of depreciation, was supposed to go to B under the partnership agreement. But this is where we use our crystal ball at the end of year six. We do this at the end of every year when we're allocating to B. And we're saying, okay, is B going to receive a distribution that's reasonably expected in the future that's not going to be offset by capital account increases? And we say, okay, in fact, B is going to receive such a distribution in year seven, reasonably likely. So in that case, what we have to do is we have to sort of pull forward the 100 of distribution, the expected distribution, and seeing how low B can go. So you pull that forward, and that takes B to negative 120 of the capital account. And so then the next thing we'd say is, OK, does B have any LDRO to support going negative. And in fact, L does under these facts, B does under these facts, B has a $100 promissory note, his $100 promissory note that he contributed. And that allows him to go to negative 100, but doesn't allow him to go to negative 120. So this entire allocation here fails the alternate economic effect test. And so it has to get reallocated. And that's all review. We actually did all that. That's the, the, the next thing is to show how it gets reallocated to A. And so what we want to do, again, this is the special PIP rule. Put the site up here again. And what that says is, okay, let's go, uh, let's do a hypothetical liquidation at the end of year five. So at the end of year five, what happens? Well, the property's worth 100. 
liquidation for book value at book liquidation at book deal, hypothetical liquidation at book value. So if that's the case, we sell the property for 100. 200 less 100 is 100. That doesn't trigger any gain set at book value. B is going to pay off the promissory note. So here, I'll draw this out. This is our hypothetical liquidation at the end of the year. At the end of year five, uh, that's the promissory note payment that increases the capital account. And then we've got 100 and 100, and the partnership has $200, 100 from the sale of property, and 100 from B's promissory note, and A would get 100 and B would get 100. So the end of year five, A gets 100, B gets zero on a net basis, because A, B is contributing 100 and then getting back 100. A just gets 100, B gives and gets. So. That's the end of year five economic results if we were to liquidate end of year five. Everybody see that? Okay, he gives a hundred, he's got to pay the note. The promissory note says he's gonna make it, he's gonna make, he's gonna, he's gonna satisfy the note no later than his liquidation of his interest. So uh, it's gonna be paid off before he liquidates his interest. And when he pays the note, that's what increases the capital account. Remember, we saw the rule that says when he contributes the note, that's the non-event. But when he pays off the note, that is the capital account increase. <clears throat> okay, now we got to compare that to end year six. So when we end year six, now the property is only worth 80. Now the property's not worth 80. Um, because there's a 20 of depreciation. Um, so what happens now? Well, this is where it gets a little bit uh, surreal, if you will, because we have to pull forward the distribution from your seven. So we're going to treat the distribution that's going to happen in year seven and year six. This regulation makes clear that you do that. It makes sense. And so we're going to get a distribution to each of A and B. That's our anticipated distribution. B is going to have to pay his promissory note. Now there's $180 of cash, 80 from the property, 100 from B's promissory note. And now there's a creditor. We've got that recourse debt, which is funding the distribution. We pull that forward too, 200. So what's going to happen there is the creditor is going to, you know, the 180 will go to the creditor. The creditor is then going to say, well, you owe me 20 more. And the partnership doesn't have anything. A is the GP, general partner. B is a limited partner. A is the one who's going to bear the burden of that because he's going to have to pay that extra 20 to satisfy the creditor. Okay, so that's going to happen on liquidation. Let's sum it up. So end year six. A. Let's start with B. B is a little easier. A gets zero. He's receiving distribution. He's making a promissory note payment of 100. This nets out to zero. A, this is again net. A 
gets 100 here, but then gives back 20 for a net of 80. Giving back the 20, that's what's going to the creditor. So the 100 of cash here, the 80 of cash here, and the 20 of cash out of A's pocket satisfies the creditor. And so now we compare the two. B is in the same position. A is the one who bears the burden of that missing 20 of depreciation, which is the whole exercise we're trying to deal with. We're trying to figure out this whole point of this exercise is to say, okay, where does that year six depreciation go? Under the agreement, it goes to B. Where does it go under PIP? Under PIP, it goes to A. And it's a little Wait, bit. Can, yeah. I, can I ask, in, that, in column B, we start with positive 100, then subtract out 100. That 100 is not labeled. Is that the depreciation? Yes, yeah, that's the year okay. one. Why didn't we do year one through six depreciation since we're at the end of year six? I mean, we could, uh, well, because uh, we're, we're trying to figure out, um, I mean, we could, um, we could, uh, it's, this becomes, so if we added that to year six, then we're going to show B's capital account as negative 20. And that's a good, you know, and so, but that negative capital account doesn't make any sense. And B is not going to have to satisfy it in the agreement. So even if you were to do that, which is fine, it really is not going to change the answer because again, the creditor comes knocking and says, where's my other 20? A could say to B, hey, your capital account is negative. B is going to say, well, that's okay. I don't care about that because the, the, the LPA on the partnership agreement says I don't have to store capital account debts. And then A is going to be left holding the bag as the sole general partner. Okay, is it oversimplifying things to just think about it in terms of, oh, um, B ends up at negative 20 and he's the limited partner. He doesn't have to restore that deficit. So just throw it all over to A. Like it, that right. seems like I'm, I'm skipping some steps, but is right. that okay? Well, it's kind of like what I mentioned before, which is that, you know, if, if, you, if we conclude that B can't get it, and the, based on the economics, and that's that's all the economic effect tests are, that by process elimination, then A must get it. So you know that that's the answer. We went through this rigmarole to show how the PIP, special PIP rule works. And what I said is in an exam situation, I would want you to apply the PIP rule and show me that it went to A and not just say, well, B can't get it, so A is the only one left in the world who can get it. And I want you to show me that. And because, you know, in the real world, there may be, you know, numerous other partners. And so you can't use a process elimination. In an exam setting, I might want to keep it simple. I only have two partners. And so, but I don't want to, I, I still want you to know the rules. This is the most complicated part of it. Again, I, you know, and I, I give partial credit. So if like you come down and you do everything right and you screw this up, you know, give it a shot, but don't, don't, don't worry too much about this stuff. And the, the best example of this type of process, it doesn't really go through it in much detail, but it does what I just did, is example one, six little eyes. So it's the exact same problem, it's some different numbers, basically. That's another chance to practice it. Okay, any other questions on, on this? All right, the next problem was uh, where we again had A and B contributing 100. They bought the building for 200. And again, years one through five are uninteresting. We go to year six, and we have 20 of depreciation in year six, and we say, okay, that gets allocated to B under the agreement. That's going to drive B below zero. Is there any 
expected distribution. And this is where we say, okay, well, we may distribute in seven, but you know, cont it's contingent. Also, the things have to happen. You know, let's say it's that we don't reasonably expect it. If we do reasonably expect the year seven, then we're back to problem G. But we let's say we don't reasonably expect it. It may happen, but it's it's remote enough that we we don't have to deal with it now. And we say, yeah, B is B does have an LDRO, he can go up to negative 100 because his promissory note supports it. So this allocation would be valid under these facts, on the alternate economic effect. That's because of B's promissory note of 100. And then we get to year seven, and in year seven, lo and behold, they borrow, they do the borrowing, they get the recourse debt, 200, and they distribute it 100 and 100. There's the actual distribution. And that takes B to negative 120. And that's what triggers the QIO. When we have a distribution that takes partner below their LDRO amount, the QIO is triggered. The QIO says, get that partner income as quickly as possible. Remember we have, uh, I'm sorry, was, well, we assume there was, let's say they assume there's a hundred of gross income and a hundred of other deductions. And then 20 of depreciation. Again, these canceled out. So we never had to deal with them before because uh, they just netted to zero. But now we can break them up to satisfy the QIO. So we're going to give B 20 of this gross income right at the top to get him back. And that's where we left off really last class. Again, that's that you should know. The QIO was triggered. We got to get B 20 of income. It can be net income if we have net income. If we don't have net income, then we start to give them gross income. And as long as we have 20, we can fully, you know, fill them up. If we only have 19 in year one, year seven, then we get weight, you know, and then it carries over to year eight, so on and so forth, until we get him that 20 back up to his LDRO amount. So that we did that last class. What we didn't talk about was, well, and we concluded that the rest, everything else is going to go to A. So that year seven of depreciation is going to go to A, and the remaining net 20 of loss here is going to go to A, because we now we only have 80 of gross income left after the QIO. That nets out to negative 20. So where does that go? Get 20 loss here, 20 of depreciation there. Under the agreement, that's all supposed to go to B. And this is supposed to be split 50-50. But we know we're at where situation now B's capital account is now at negative 100, can't go any lower. So none of that can get allocated to B. Again, logically, we know that's going to get reallocated to A. But how does the PIP rule work? How do we do that? So again, let's look at this. Uh, let's do an end year six. Hypothetical liquidation, we would have 80 of building value. So let's, this is our hypothetical liquidation. We have 80 of building value. B would contribute 100 on the promissory note. And we would be left with um, he would be left with um, 80 and 100. Yes, uh, so we would have uh, 80 of cash here. If we liquidate into year six, we've got uh, 180 of cash, 80 from here, 
100 from there is going to go 80 and 100. So A is going to get 100. B gets net 20 loss. Because again, he's putting in 100 and only getting back 80. So again, this is net. So at the end of year six, A would get 100, B would put in net 20. Now we get to any questions on year six. In year seven, now the property is worth 60. We've got a creditor now. A and they receive clean this up a little bit. Then your seven, we've got a distribution that your seven distribution happens. And um, the capital accounts look like this. Should be negative 120 or negative 140. It doesn't really matter if you could consider your seven as well. But A is going to um, get 100. That's this. And then, again, think about what happens here. There's 60 of cash here. There's 100 of cash from B uh, satisfying the promissory note. That's 160. The creditor is going to come knocking for 200. B doesn't have to pay because he's an LP, doesn't have to restore capital account uh, deficits. Um, Actually, this should be, sorry, this should be negative 20. It's negative, that's all that matters. So A is gonna have to kick in 40. Gives back 40. So A nets to 60. B in your seven nets to zero because he puts in 100 and then the year seven distribution gives him back 100. So again, we compare these two and we see that B is improved by 20. Well, that's the QIO. That's what the QIO is designed to realize. Um, so that reflects that. A goes from 100 to 60. That's the 40 of economic burden. And that's what shows that that missing 40 of allocations, the 20 of depreciation, and the 20 of net loss here gets reallocated to A under PIP. Which again, we know logically it had to go to A, but this is what shows you the mechanics of how it works. And this is this is quite difficult and annoying and because it involves this promissory note, it, I very likely wouldn't test you on this piece of it. Now again, you should, the QIO, you should understand how that's triggered and what it does. But this, this part um, is just a little bit maybe too tough or too um, complex. So I wouldn't, and there's no, the other thing is there's no good example. Um, unlike F, which has that reg example that shows what to work. There's no example that I'm aware of that illustrates exactly how this works. So um, don't worry so much about G. Okay, any questions on G though, on this? So one last thing on F and G. So they're both uh, triggered by distributions. In, in F, we have the anticipated distribution that's gonna drive B uh, too low. And so, and that, and because it would drive B too low, it would um, deprive B of the depreciation deduction that B uh, is entitled to under the agreement, right? The effect in F is to shift 20 of depreciation 
from B, who the partners want to get, over to A. So it defeats the partner's expectations by depriving B of 20 of depreciation that B was supposed to get. Um, so one question is, and in, in G, it's even worse. In G, in G we're gonna, instead of B getting the depreciation, B is gonna lose the depreciation and B is gonna get this QIO. So instead of B getting 20 of depreciation in year seven, B is getting gross income in year seven. So we're defeating you know, the partner's expectation. It's getting wacky. Um, and so one, and, and the G is triggered by the fact that we have a distribution in year seven that we didn't anticipate, but it happened. So from a planning perspective, that may be a problem to sort of say, okay, well, we're gonna really screw things up the way things are supposed to work. What, what, what might we think about? What's an easy, relatively easy way to fix this, this problem, to avoid both the F if, we, if, the, if the loan, if the distribution is certain enough, it's gonna happen, then we got a problem sort of on the front end in year six. If we don't, the loan isn't predictable enough, then we got a problem in year seven when it actually, the distribution actually happens. Any thoughts? Could we have somebody sign a piece of paper that uh, would solve this problem, these problems? So again, these are triggered by distributions to B that take him, his capital account too low. Well, as was a solution in some of the earlier problems, B could increase his capital account. So yeah, I mean, B could increase his capital account um, B could, they could delay the distribution. Um, both of those would work. Those, you know, can change the economics. And what I'm going to propose, and, you know, maybe somebody will figure it out before I propose it, is going to change the deal, but less so than those, than, than, than again, uh, either not receiving, you know, delaying the distribution. So the cash stays in the partnership and waits until B gets more capital count, either from contributions or allocations of income, or B can contribute more cash or property, um, which is, if you think about contributing cash, it's really like the same thing as a delay, because instead of getting the loan distribution cash free, you know, without, you know, you're getting it, but you're contributing. You know, you're, so it's the same thing as sort of delaying the loan. But I'm thinking about something where B gets his cash at the same time. What could be, what could they do? So what if uh, the distribution to, to B in year seven, whether, you know, again, whether it's expected or not, is just a loan from the partnership to B. So uh, the partnership still issues the cash to B but instead of being a distribution, which is just here, it's your money, free and clear. The partnership says to be here, I'm gonna loan you this hundred dollars. Now you gotta pay an interest rate. What's sort of nice in these times is interest rates are so low, there's applicable federal rates that you have to use that are minimum rates, but they're pretty low. Um, and uh, then, uh, Later on, once B has enough capital, and a loan from the partnership to the partner is not a distribution. It's just a loan. So it's not gonna affect capital accounts. And um, then later on, when B does have enough capital account, say from allocations of profits, then the partnership can then distribute the cash by effectively sort of canceling the note. And so that's similar to what Jacob's proposal was, um, but it's a little bit less disruptive because B still gets his cash. I mean, this is kind of thing where they're going to do that, and then the tax lawyer comes in and says, "Okay, but you can't do it the way you want to do it. You got to, you know, unless you know, you're you're willing to sacrifice B's tax tax deductions." Um, so that's something to think about. So we recharacterize the distribution to B as a loan, and I said that that does change the deal. Because if, let's say, um, the profit, you know, the profits don't materialize, things go down the tubes, 
Now B is sort of on the hook. And another way to think about it is kind of like B contributing another promissory. I mean, that's it. B can take the distribution of cash and then issue another promissory note to increase his LBRO. But again, that can have real significant, that can have economic, real economic effects. For example, if the partnership goes bankrupt, then the trustee, the bankruptcy trustee is going to collect those notes. And those notes are going to go pay somebody else. And so it's not without risk, but it's something to think about. And again, what B would have to weigh, as we've seen before, is going to be the tax benefit of getting the deduction, avoiding the QIO, et cetera, versus the non-tax risk of actually being called to pay on the pay this promise right now. Okay, questions on that? All right, the last thing is um, the last problem, problem three, dealing with this flip arrangement where we had a situation where the um, we're going to allocate losses, the early year losses, disproportionately to one partner. Then we're going to allocate the annual gains disproportionately in the same disproportion, the same partner. And then once we reach a point of profitability overall, sort of a net break even point, all future gains and losses be allocated in a different ratio. And we talked about how if you end up in the black, uh, meaning profitable overall, then those, the disproportionate allocation in the early years are gonna be transitory basically, as a conceptual matter. Um, and is that a problem? Does that re require us to apply the transitory test? Does that require, um, us to apply the after-tax test, because again, you're looking for these offsetting allocations and they are offsetting. So let's just look at two reg examples. Uh, example two, this is dash 1B5, 1.704 dash 1B5, example two. And this is an illustration of the five-year rule we talked about, um, but it's, it, it's the problem we're talking about. So we've got this C and D, and they're buying this five-year property, and they're leasing it. Um, to a less C, and they can, you know, they create the spreadsheet. They know what's going to happen. Um, they know. Uh, what's going to um, happen. Their lease, it's a 12-year lease with a financially secure corporation. That's suggesting that you know, the lease payments are going to get paid. Um, that's the only risk, really. Um, and so uh, you've got this lease, and here are the lease payments. And we've got, uh, well, not here are the lease payments. Here is the net income. We have losses in the early years. Why do we have losses in the early years? We have losses in the early years because we have things like depreciation, accelerated depreciation on the equipment. We're borrowing money, so we've got interest. Interest may be higher in the early years because the, the loan amortizes over time. But uh, likely this is because of the, we have large depreciation deductions in the early years, and then those depreciation deductions fall off. In the later years, we're profitable. And if you sum all that together, this is a profitable exercise uh, to the tune of, um, I think it's $90,000. So we have, um, we have 400,000 of aggregate losses. Then we start to make money. We have 490 of aggregate income. So we end up overall plus 90. And we have this arrangement. We're going to allocate disproportionately the early losses, disproportionately to C, the later income, disproportionately to C. And then once we hit the point of profitability, everything equally. So we flip from 90-10 to 50-50. And this is classic transitory. 
I mean, if we know this is going to happen, then the allocations of losses, this portion that are going to be offset, there's a strong likelihood that they're going to be offset and capital accounts will be in the same place as if we just did 50 50 the whole way. But this arrangement is protected because of the five year rule. Um, and the analysis here is an explanation of that. So this is okay, even if this is a slam dunk. So you can plan into this. You can run your spreadsheets and say, this is going to happen. Again, you could have this, this lease with a high quality tenant that's insured, guaranteed, all this. So, you know, you know it's going to happen. It's basically like a bond. Um, and it's okay and be okay because there's the five-year rule protects it. Okay, does everybody understand that? But that would be transitory and it would uh, trigger also the uh, after-tax effects rule because again, um, they all end up in the same place pre-tax. So it's all of this tax. And again, the, the, we need to know the tax rates and all that stuff to sort of crunch that together, but we don't, we don't have to worry about it. Okay, any questions on problem two? Example two? Well, example three is like the flip side. So, you know, this, this is like slam dunk. We know what's going to happen. Our crystal ball is totally clear. Um, it's like the sun will rise. This is what will happen. The sun will rise tomorrow. This is what will happen. In example three, it's like, who the heck knows what's going to happen? We got E and F, and we get the impression that the reg writers wanted to describe the most speculative startup business enterprise they could think of. It was experimental electronic devices. And E is going to contribute a little bit of cash and F is the cash. You know, we got the money and brains. Uh, F is the money, E is the brains. Good to perform all the services. And as is common, they're going to give the money guy, money person, all the early deductions. They're going to, they're going to spend a lot of money in the early years. They're not going to make money until they start selling stuff or licensing stuff, which is not going to happen in the early years. So they're going to have a lot of deductions up front, R&D, expenses. And then hopefully they make a successful product and they can begin to sell and license it. And then they'll be profitable. And But they're going to flip 90 to 10 until they're profitable. And then afterwards, everything equally. So another flip arrangement, the same as in problem two, example two. And the big three is satisfied and all that. And it had, so it has economic effect, but the, the upshot here is in view of the nature of the partnership activity, there's not a strong likelihood that they'll be offset. And therefore, the effect is substantial. The idea here is that this is, you know, our crystal ball is very cloudy here. This is a startup. It may very well be likely that they do all the R&D expenses and it, it fails, the product fails. Fails to launch, fails to, you know, gets beat to market. Right? And this is what I talked about last class, like Silicon Valley startups, you know, early stage, you know, failure rates in excess of 90%. And if that's the case, if there's only a 10% chance that we ever get to the point where we're sharing taxable income and loss equally, then and we're not having offsetting allocation. There's a real risk we're not having offset, offsetting, and therefore F is going to be a lot worse off by getting all of these losses than compared to a 50-50 sharing ratio. And so this is like a spectrum. On the one hand, we've got you know, absolute certainty. On the other hand, we've got your Silicon Valley startup. In between, you know, maybe gets a little bit hairy, but the bottom line is that this is a real business risk. You know, uh, this should, you know, these flip arrangements are common and should work. You know, we worry more so when you get into these structured leasing type of things, which are, you know, can start to look financially more like bonds than investing in a real business. Okay, so back to problem three. What does that mean is that this, these allocations should 
work, they should have validity on the, uh, they should be substan have substantial economic effect because, you know, it's a real business. Well, let me, let me get back to it. We don't know. I mean, it says to purchase and lease a computer. It, yeah, is it more like problem two where, you know, there's a, there's certainty and if so, then we have to do the five year rule and see, you know, how long it's gonna take. Or again, more commonly, you know, if this is a real business enterprise um, with real risk, then this should be okay. Because again, E would lose out, could lose out. Um, well, for after tax test, E could lose um, compared to the baseline. For the transitory test, E's capital accounts could end up in a wildly different place than the baseline of 50-50. Okay, so it bound lines with example three, uh, problem three is we just don't know, is it more like two or more like three? You know, what are the facts we need to know more about the nature of the activities um, to, to, to apply? And it's really designed to get us to think about these two examples. Okay, questions on that? Okay, well, we're done with substantial economic effect. And now we move on to what I think is kind of like the, the nadir of this class in terms of annoying stuff. Um, we kind of, um, we're kind of digging down into more um, jargon. Uh, and, but after we get through this next topic, which is non-recourse deductions um, and their sibling, the minimum gain chargeback, once we get through that, then we start to go back up towards the light. So if you're feeling demoralized, um, don't worry too much because it gets, things get better. Um, usually, you know, we're heading towards spring break when we're going through this stuff. And so it's kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. So, but um, I warn you, this is kind of um, uh, the toughest stuff we'll do, at least getting, wrapping your head around and dealing with the jargon. So, um, so the problem with non-recourse deductions is that uh, with economic effect, the substantial economic effect test, we start with the idea of, well, who bears the economic burden of these deductions? Trying to figure out what's the real world consequence of these deductions that we're trying to allocate. Well, if we have what are called non-recourse deductions, then the answer to that question is no partner bears the burden of these deductions. The bank, the lender bears the burden of those deductions. And we'll see how that works, but you know, you can, if you assume that to be the case, that no partner bears the economic burden of these deductions that we're dealing with, then the economic effect analysis just falls through, right? It's just, um, and so who gets those deductions? And you might say, well, the bank should get the deductions. You know, the, you know, the partners don't get it. That's not the way the tax system works. Um, and so let's just take an example. This gets back to some tax one concepts to build on the Crane case and the Tufts case. And so let's say we, I'm just by myself and I take um, $20 of cash and then I borrow 80 from a bank. And it's a non-recourse loan, which means the bank has said, you're going to take this money and buy property for a hundred. That's my hundred dollar purchase price. We're going to take a security interest in the property. It's called a building. And you borrower are going to pay interest. You're going to pay principal payments when principal payments are due. And if you default, if you fail to do what's required, then we can foreclose on the property. But if the foreclosure sale is insufficient to satisfy the bank's note, you're off the hook. Uh, the bank has no recourse against your other assets. So the worst case scenario for a borrower on a non-recourse loan is that they lose the property. So if the property drops below the level of the debt, you can just walk away without any risk. 
Unlike a recourse loan, where if you walk away from the property, the bank will sell the property, apply the, for, the proceeds of the foreclosure sale to your loan. If it's not enough, that's called a deficiency, and they'll sue you for a deficiency. And they'll garnish your wages and do whatever they have to do to get the money back, their money. Back. But with a non-recourse loan, the bank has said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to assert a deficiency. So the bank is taking on that risk, additional risk in a non-recourse loan. Sometimes students will ask, well, why would a bank make a non-recourse loan? If they can make recourse loans, why, why would they ever make non-recourse loans? Any thoughts? Why would a bank ever make a non-recourse loan? Maybe they get a higher interest rate for it if they think this property is secure enough? Exactly. But they're, they're taking on more risk. It's all this allocation of risk. They're saying, you know, we're going to take on more risk and therefore we can charge a higher interest rate. We're getting paid for that risk and we think that that is a good bet. It's all, you know, risk and reward, right? And so we'll take on a little more risk. And again, depending on how much risk they take on, they can jack up the interest rate. So, um, that's the way they're slicing and dicing risk in this deal. But anyway, in this deal, I'm buying this building for 100, and let's just say it depreciates, uh, the, the, the depreciation schedule is $20 per year for five years. So we go to year one, and I get 20 of depreciation. And this is just me, I'm not, there's no partnership here, it's just me. So I get 20 of depreciation. Well, let's start out. What's my basis in the property? Well, my basis is the full 100. And that's be, even though I may never have to pay back this 80. And that's the Crane case. Crane says your, bet, your basis includes uh, not only borrowings under recourse debt, but borrowings under non-recourse debt. That we treat this, this is just borrowed proceeds and the fact that I may not have to pay it back doesn't matter, it still goes into my basis. So I get 100 of basis. Even though I've only put in 20 at this point, and I may never put in any more. So that's Crane says I get basis credit for non recourse debt. So then I get to depreciate it. Let's say it's just this five year depreciation schedule. And at the end of year one, my basis is 80. And if I sold it for 80, I, the bank would get its 80, and I would be out to 20. So I bear the burden of this depreciation, this tax depreciation, where hypothetically, matched by economic depreciation, that's gonna come out of my pocket, not the banks. So it kind of makes sense that I get the depreciation for year one. But what about year two? Year two, now that would take the basis down to 60. And if the property was worth 60, the, the reduction in value from 80 to 60, you know, hypothetically, assuming there's this reduction in value from 80 to 60, I don't care about that. Once it gets below 80, it's underwater. And it's a term people use a lot in financial crisis with housing, your house is underwater. It means the property is worth less than the debt. If it's underwater as a recourse loan, that's a big problem. And, and to the, the amount that's underwater is an, is an issue. If you're underwater in a non-recourse loan situation, it doesn't really matter how much underwater you are. It's no longer your problem. It's the bank's problem. And But you get the year two depreciation. The tax law says you get it. And all the way down to zero. Yeah. So in year one, this is, you know, you sort of, you are feeling that. But years two through five, there, the bank is feeling it, but we get, we give you the depreciation and that's a tax benefit um, to give you this depreciation for uh, economic burdens, economic uh, burden that you won't personally feel. Now it's gonna come back because the flip side of the crane rule is the Tufts rule and Tufts says, that when you dispose of property subject to a non-recourse debt, the amount of the non-recourse debt is included in your amount realized. Any type of 
call taxable disposition. So assume we abandon the property. So we say, you know what? This property is below 80. I'm walking away. Lender, here are the keys. What's my amount realized? Well, you might think the amount realized is zero. You're walking away, your hands are clean. In some respects, you're not even getting discharged the liability because you were never really responsible to pay it. But from a tax perspective, we treat it as a debt up front. So we're going to treat it at the end, it gets included in the amount realized. So your amount realized is 60, 80, sorry, the amount of the debt. What's your adjusted basis? Let's say we do this at the end of year two. Your adjusted basis is 60. So you have 20 of gain. That's recapturing it. Recapturing that depreciation. And again, only a tax lawyer would, you know, be in a situation where you, you walk away from a property and you get nothing and you have gain. But you do, you have gain. And what it's doing is it's recapturing that 20 of, you know, you call this kind of like a phantom deduction because you didn't bear the burden. This is like phantom income. And it offsets the phantom deduction. But you're a winner. You like this rule because the early deductions matched by later income, even if my tax rates remain the same, time value of money says I'll take these early tax savings and pay it back later. So again, let's assume my tax rate is 50% in each year. I'm getting tax $10 of tax savings now in year two, and I get $10 of extra tax in year three. That's an interest-free loan from the government of $10. And I like interest-free loans. They used to be even better when interest rates were higher, but they're still good. So that's the rule, that's the crane and toughness. So you can borrow on a non-recourse basis. You get credit for the uh, non-recourse debt. You get depreciation. Um, that's based on a non-recourse debt. And you're gonna end up later on having gain that offsets that depreciation. Um, but you'll take it uh, as a time value money. And the, er, any questions about Crane or Tufts? Crane and Tufts? So what, um, the, the problem now with partnership is what happens when we have, we call these non-recourse deductions, these deductions here that are borne by the lender and not by the taxpayer, here are the partners. So we could say, you know what, in a partnership, you don't get them, you know, nobody gets them, no partner gets them. We could do that, we could say nobody gets them. Um, one problem with that is we would be treating partners worse off than if they were doing this individually. So we don't really want to discourage it. We could do this on our own, but I can't if I partner together with somebody. That would discourage partnerships from forming that would otherwise be formed. We treat partnerships worse, partners worse than individuals. And we're really trying to neutralize that. That's really what oh, these all rules are designed to do. It's to neutralize the taxation of partners as partners and individuals doing things alone. So that door number one is that we can't, you know, that's been taken off the table, but uh, by Congress. Two would be, it, it, well, two is even more of a failed idea, which is that, well, we could figure out who bears the economic burden. Again, nobody, no partner bears it. So, Three is we got to give it to some partners and we could just make it completely elective and just say, hey, give it to whichever partner you want and however you want, because there's no economics to it. So it's just a free for all. Well, that would allow people to come into partnerships and uh, just to get this depreciation. You can imagine partnerships being formed just to generate this and to give it basically the high, high bracket people would love this stuff. Because high bracket people, the higher the bracket, the greater the, the interest-free loan is. 50% bracket payer gets a $10 interest-free loan. 30% bracket payer only gets a $6 interest-free loan. 
So you would have, basically have partnerships that were formed and they would just allocate between like corporations who are subject to lower rates, uh, people who don't pay taxes, strictly to sort of allocate all the non-recourse deductions to the to the high bracket partner. So that's thought to be not, that would be just uh, opening up the floodgates. So what the, what the reg writers decided to do is they said, okay, we're gonna allow the partners to elect how to allocate the non-recourse deduction, but we're gonna put some conditions on it. And one of the conditions is we're gonna have, we're gonna have a reasonable consistency test. We're gonna say, you can allocate these non-recourse deductions specially, um, you know, or flexibly, but they have to be, the way you allocate has to be consistent with the way you allocate some other items that are significant. So you can't have a deal where you allocate all the non-recourse deductions to partner X and allocate that partner very little of everything else. Uh, you're gonna have to tether it to the way some other items which have economic effect are allocated. So we still have flexibility, but it's constrained to some extent. Okay, so let's look at the rule there for that and then we'll get back into the jargon. So basically when we have non-recourse deductions, we have a different test. We don't apply substantial economic effect to it because it has no economic effect. So we have a special rule, a special safe harbor. So substantial economic effect is one safe harbor that applies in general to allocations. For allocations of non-recourse deductions, we have another different safe harbor. And these regs are turned to 1.704-2, 1.704-2. It's mercifully a lot shorter than dash one, uh, which is what we've been in, but it's, again, it's jargon filled. So I find it more esoteric. And that's one. But here, um, here's our safe harbor for non-recourse deductions. And they don't have, they can't have substantial economic effect because they can't have economic effect, as we've established. So this is one of those situations where they're deemed to be in accordance with PIP. So we, this is what blesses it. These are deemed to be in accordance with PIP. Remember, allocations and agreement are valid if they are have substantial economic effect or in accordance with PIP. Here is a deemed accordance with PIP. Here are these four requirements. We have an and between three and four, so we have to satisfy all. So one is pretty straightforward. We're gonna have economic effect either through the general test or the alternate economic effect test. Here is the most, the one that requires the analysis. Like this, you look at the, um, You can look at the agreement for one. This requires an analysis. Um, it says uh, the partnership agreement provides for allocation of non recourse in a manner that is reasonably consistent with allocations of non recourse deduction, but uh, that's really consistent with allocations that have some to the effect of some other significant partnership item attributable to the property securing the non recourse liabilities. So you're looking at how do they allocate rent if it's a building, how do they allocate rents? How do they allocate maintenance expenses? Um, how do they allocate, say, property taxes? Um, if those are significant partnership items. How are those allocated? And is this the way we allocate non-recourse deductions reasonably consistent with that approach? So we can't go wild and allocate non-recourse deductions in some way that's completely inconsistent with everything else we're doing with respect to the property. So that's prong two. Prong three is that the partnership agreement has to have this minimum gain chargeback. And Tufts creates this minimum gain that we talked about because the amount realized includes the amount of non-recourse debt, that even if you sell the property for zero, you give it back, you abandon it, you're still gonna have this minimum gain. We're gonna have to charge back that minimum gain the same way we allocated non-recourse deductions. So whoever gets the non-recourse deductions in the early years is gonna get the resulting gain and that, that inevitably is gonna happen in the later years. So we can't disassociate the non-recourse deductions, give that to one partner 
and then give the offsetting gain that we're going to recognize to another partner, it's got to come back in the same proportion. And then four is everything else has to be respected. So, you know, if you have other, basically this allows, gives the government the flexibility that if, you know, other things get out of whack, you know, all bets are off. Um, so the most important ones really are gonna be two and three. And three is pretty just um, technical. Two is where you might, you have some analysis because there's these words that can be unclear. What does that mean reasonably consistent? You know, we, uh, we could also have a question as to what's a significant partnership item. That could also be a question. But this is mechanical, minimally charge that is mechanical. Okay. Any questions? All right, well, that's all. There's just really no way to teach or learn this in the absence of a problem. So, I'm going to just, we're going to not finish this, but this is the problem on page 151. We're going to see how this works. So in this problem, we've got G and L. Uh, G is going to contribute A and L is gonna contribute 320. That's our capital contributions. The partners are gonna borrow another 1.6 million on a non-recourse basis. They're gonna buy a building for 2 million. Okay, and uh, everything is going to cancel out except for depreciation, and we have two hundred thousand of depreciation each year. And we allocate the depreciation. We're told we're going to allocate everything twenty percent to G, eighty percent to L, until it reaches profitability, and that's going to flip to fifty fifty. So since we're just losing money in year one, right? Everything else, the operating expenses and operating income cancel out, leaving depreciation to be the left. We're losing money in year one. And so the year one depreciation would be allocated under the agreement, 40 and 160. Now one, step and we're going to have to analyze uh, this and whether this is respected but one thing that you have to do here when you have non-recourse debt so here's like in your outlines or whatever there's a trigger here when you have non-recourse debt you want to check and check the partnership minimum gain each year uh, look at the partnership minimum gain so we're going to do a year zero minimum gain which would be zero because that's before the partnership was formed we're going to do year one minimum gain. You have what's called a minimum gain table to see what the minimum gain is at the end of each year. So at the end of year one, what is our minimum gain? What is minimum gain? Let's look back to the reg. So this is dash two. Um, D dash two D. Dash two D. Partnership minimum gain. The amount of partnership minimum gains determined by first computing for each partnership non recourse liability. Any gain the partnership would realize is disposed of the property subject to that liability, the non recourse liability for no consideration. So how much gain would we recognize, the partnership recognize if we sold the property subject to the non-recourse debt for zero? In other words, we just abandoned it. So what would happen if we sold it for zero? Well, the amount realized would be 1.6 million. 
our adjusted basis is 1.8 million, we would have a loss, not a gain. So we have no minimum gain at the end of year one. We have a loss, not a gain. You can't have negative minimum gain. There's no minimum gain. What that means, we have no minimum gain, we have no increase in minimum gain. That means these deductions are not non-recourse deductions and they're just uh, the substantial economic effect test. And this is the idea that that's eating through the 400,000 of equity that's contributed here. So that we're not yet to the point where the bank is bearing the burden. G and L are bearing the burden of this. The bank is still gonna be made whole at the end of year one. So because there's no increase in minimum gain, these are uh, what we call recourse deductions, not non-recourse deductions, and they're tested on the substantial economic effect. So for G, the big three is met. For L, is um, has no requirement to restore, but there's a QIO, it doesn't drive L's capital account below zero, so they have economic effect. And then there's substantiality, um, you know, again, real business, uh, we're gonna flip to 50-50 down the road, but that may never happen. So there's enough risk there. So these allocations are valid under the substantial economic effect. Okay, any questions about year one? So that's a review, it's nice. We, we reviewed substantial economic effect and we'll do it again for year two. Again, year two and year two, What's our minimum gain? Again, what if we sold the property for zero at the end of, for no consideration, we relinquished the property, gave it over to somebody, subject to the debt. Well, we have 1.6 million of amount realized and a 1.6 million of basis, we again have no minimum gain. So we have no increase in minimum gain from year one to year two. So again, that tells us these deductions are recourse deductions tested under substantial economic effect. And again, for the same reason, they're valid in year two. L is getting close. L's capital account is now zero, but it's not below zero. So it's valid. All right, well now we get to year three. What's the minimum gain at the end of year three? Well, now the property's basis is 1.4 million. So if we sold it for zero, abandoned it, our amount realized would be 1.6. Our adjusted basis is 1.4. We have 200,000 of minimum gain. Now we have an increase in minimum gain. And this minimum gain literally is minimum gain. Like what this means is that there is no possible way that this partnership will get out without recognizing at least 200,000 of gain. If it abandons the building, there'll be 200,000 of Tufsky. If it earns 200,000 of cash, that allows it to pay off the debt, with the two with the 1.4 million of building, that 200,000 of cash income is going to be is going to be um, re, re, recognized by the partnership. The the uh, it's possible the lender could reduce the debt. There could be a workout where the lender says, "Okay, let's reduce the debt by 200,000 or more." Well, if you reduce by 200,000 or more, there's going to be 200,000 or more of COD income. So the partnership will recognize 200,000 of gain at some point down the road, undoubtedly. Tufts ensures that. Um, but what that means is we'll, uh, we'll see when you have an increase in minimum gain, that generally means that you that increase is going to uh, create non-recourse deductions. So we have 200,000 of non-recourse deductions. We only have one type of deduction here that we're dealing with, but it, even if we have other deductions, the first uh, uh, 
type of deductions that are treated as non-recourse are cost recovery on the property subject to the, the non-recourse debt. So that means that this 200,000 of depreciation in year three are non-recourse deductions. And I, I put an asterisk there because they're just different. I mean, you have to keep track of them. But we test that under the dash 2E safe harbor. And the big question here, well, again, we're satisfying the economic effect test, that's prong one, reasonably consistent where we allocate other items. Well, we're allocating all other items. Uh, there's rent, there's, um, there's maintenance expenses. We're allocating everything, 20% G, 80% L. So this is pretty easy. There's really no other way we're allocating things now, currently with respect to the building. We have this minimum gain charge back in the agreement. We'll talk about what that means. And we haven't had anything else in our agreement get disrespected by the IRS. So everything, our partnership agreements, allocations are being respected. And so these are valid, not because they have substantial economic effect, but because they're deemed to be in accordance with PIP pursuant to this. Okay, so we have an increase in minimum gain that results in non-recourse deductions. That causes these to be non-recourse deductions and then causes it to be tested under this rule. We only have three minutes here, but let's just do one thing. Let's say in year four, on January 1 of year four, the property is sold or abandoned. Let's just say it's abandoned. So year four, the partnership says, you know, lender here, take it. Well, what happens then is the amount realized is 1.6 million, 1.4 million of basis. We have 200,000 of gain. So we have 200,000 of gain. How does that get allocated? Well, again, let's do our, now what about our minimum gain in your, at the end of year four is zero. The end of year four, the debt is gone. There's no minimum gain, it's been paid off. So our minimum gain went down. When, when your minimum gain goes up, that indicates the presence of non-recourse deductions. When your minimum gain goes down, that typically triggers the minimum gain chargeback. Minimum gain chargeback says, when your, min when your minimum gain goes down, you allocate gain to the partners in accordance with their shared non-recourse deductions. So we're gonna charge back the 40 and the 160. This is not all that interesting because we're doing it always for you know, 20 percent, 80 percent. We'll see shortly in later parts of this problem where it gets a little bit more interesting. But that's the idea. We now minimum gain goes up, we have non-recourse deductions. Minimum gain goes down, triggers a minimum gain chargeback. And then what happens because the partnership has nothing now. This is gone. The partnership has no cash. We end up with a situation where the capital accounts are at um, zero, which is where they should be. They both walk away. What ended up happening that, you know, G lost his 80. L lost his 320. These canceled out. I mean, again, time value money, they don't. This is the benefit, you know, of this. Event. You got the early deductions and the later income, but leaving aside that benefit, which exists in the tax law, um, these are canceled out. And so it all makes sense. Any questions on that? Okay, we're, we're in the middle of this. That's fine. We're a little bit uh, slowed down. We probably won't get beyond non recourse deductions next class. So we'll be like exactly one class behind. That's okay. We've got some time. Um, we'll take it slow and we'll continue on with this problem. And, um, you know, by the time we work through this a few times, I think it'll be made more clear. So, but this is the time where if you're, you want to get really comfortable with uh, substantial economic effects and non recourse deductions, it'll pay off down the road. Um, 
So again, I encourage you to, to fight with this stuff um, now and not leave it uh, too long before you really understand it. Okay. Um, see you, see everybody on Monday. Have a good weekend. Again, as always, email with any questions. Thanks. Bye-bye.